Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. Today we will take a look at the netcode of H1C1 King of the Kill, which is an early access game that drops you and 199 other players on a map to fight to the death. But before we dive into the specifics of this title, we must take a look at a few networking basics, which you need to know in order to understand the results of my tests. The reason why I include this basic information in every video is that I do not want that someone who is new to those netcode analysis videos must watch another video first to understand what the analysis is about. Also I've noticed that it doesn't really work to tell your viewers to watch another video first, which then leads to them drawing the wrong conclusions or they simply do not understand the information which is provided in the video. Now, if you already know the networking basics from one of my previous videos, then you can use the timecode link inside the description of this video to skip that part. Sadly, I cannot provide you with an annotation anymore, because YouTube decided that the new end screen disables annotations, and I can also not use the cards feature to provide you a skip function, as a card is not allowed to link to the same video. So let's start with the ping. What is that and where does the term come from? If you've seen the movie The Hunt for Red October, then you might remember that scene where Sean Connery gave the order to check the distance to the US submarine with one active sonar ping. The way this works is that your ship sends out an audio signal, which then gets reflected by other objects in the water. And on your ship you have microphones or hydrophones which hear that reflection. You can then determine the distance between you and that object by measuring the time between sending the audio signal and receiving the reflection. The ping that we talk about for network connections between different devices is pretty much the same thing. Your device sends an ICMP echo request to another network device, like a game server, which then sends an ICMP echo reply back to your device. Now when we measure the time between sending the request and receiving the answer, then this gives us the ping or round trip time of the data. So the ping tells us how long the data has to travel through the copper and fiber optic cables to reach the other device. And the longer it takes the data to get to its destination, the bigger the difference between what we see on our monitor and what the other players see on theirs, which is what we call lag. So when I jump, then it takes this information some time to reach the server and the other client. With short distances and good routing between the players and the server, this delay or lag is also very low. However, the bigger the distance between the clients, the longer it will take until they receive an update on what is happening. So the higher your ping, the more you will lag, which means that you have a bad experience. But it's not just the player with the high ping that suffers. Depending on how strong the lag compensation is in a game, the high ping player can also give the low ping player a bad experience, as the low ping player then either receives damage very far behind cover or gets shot by the high ping player before he can even see him. However, you cannot determine your ping by drawing a straight line on a map between your home and the location where the server is hosted, because the copper and fiber optic cables take a very different route, and the data that you send to the server has to pass through multiple routers before it reaches the server. So when a router has to forward data, then it usually tries to choose the best route. This means that when everything works as it should, then your data will take the shortest route to the game server. But it can happen that a router either chooses a bad route or that it has to choose a worse one when the better one is down, or that it is configured to choose the cheapest route. Such can then lead to quite big detours for your data, which can also result in much higher pings and an increased risk of packet loss, since your data might have to pass through many more routers then. So when you always play on the same server and suddenly notice that you have a much higher ping than usual, then this could be caused by routing, and in such cases you will have to call your internet service provider so that they can check their routing tables. And if you want to help them to get the issue fixed faster, then you can provide them with tracer route data for that server. For that you open the command prompt, type in tracer and the IP of the game server that you have problems with. You will then get a list of all the hops between you and the game server, with the pings between you and each of these hops. However, please be aware that depending on its configuration, a hop might not reply to your ICMP echo request at all or with a delay. And the same is true for game servers where many do not reply when you try to ping them from the command prompt. So the length of the route that connects the client to the server and the amount of hops between them defines how long it takes data to travel between them. So the lag that we experience in a game can never be lower than the data travel time, because for that we would have to break the laws of physics to speed up the electrons or photons that are used to communicate with the server. 
What adds an additional delay on top of the travel time of our data is how frequently we send and receive it. So when we send and receive 30 updates per second, then there is more time between the updates than when we send and receive 60 updates per second. So by sending and receiving more updates per second, you can decrease the additional delay that is added on top of the travel time of your data. But where is that data coming from? This is where the term tick or simulation rate comes into play, which is how many times per second the game processes and produces data. So when we have a tick or simulation rate of 30, then this will cause more delay than when you use a tick rate of 60, which also allows update rates of 60 Hz then. But it's not only important how many simulations are done per second, it's also critical that the server finishes a tick as fast as possible, because at a tick rate of 60 Hz, it only has a processing window of 16.66 milliseconds for every simulation step. So at the beginning of a tick, the server starts to process the data it received and it runs its simulations. Once that is done, it sends the results to the clients and then sleeps until the next tick happens. The faster the server finishes a tick, the earlier the clients will receive new data from the server, which reduces the delays between players and makes the hit registration feel more responsive. This is something that I showed in my previous Battlefield 4 tests where the netgraph displays the time the server needs to finish a tick. So when it comes to the server's performance, then it's imperative that it finishes a simulation step as fast as possible, or at least inside the processing window that is given by the tick rate. When it gets close to that limit or even fails to process a tick inside of the time frame, then you will instantly notice this as that results in all sorts of strange gameplay issues like rubber banding, players teleporting, hits getting rejected, physics failing, etc. Now, what options do developers have when it comes to providing servers? One solution is that you pay hosters to set up dedicated servers for your games in their data centers, to which the players then connect to. This means that your game server is running on powerful hardware and the data center has enough bandwidth to handle all those players that connect to it. Also, when the matchmaking makes sure that all players have more or less the same ping to the game server, then you can avoid that players have an unfair advantage or give other players a bad experience. One of the downsides is that if you don't have a game that builds around the idea of the community running these servers, then the publisher or game studio has to pay for them and they are quite expensive. Another problem is that when you release your game worldwide, then you also need to make sure that you have enough server locations to provide all of your players with low latency servers. If you don't do that, then you create many high ping players and that is a problem for your entire community, not just for the players who don't have servers near them. A different approach, which many people falsely refer to as peer-to-peer, -peer, is that you simply use the PC or console of a player to host the game, which means that he becomes the server. With this solution, the game studio does not have to pay for expensive, dedicated game servers, which must also be available in many different regions. This also allows players located in remote regions to play with their friends at relatively low latency. The downside is that the player who is also the server gets an advantage, because he has zero lag, which means that he will see you before you see him, and he can fire at you before you can fire at him. Then we also have the problem that all players connect to the host through his consumer-grade internet connection, when the worst case he could even use Wi-Fi locally. This frequently results in a lot of lag, packet loss, rubber banding and an unreliable hit registration. But the most frustrating part of such client-hosted matches is that when your host disappears, then the game must choose another player to host the match, which means that the whole game pauses for several seconds until the host migration has finished. And if this wouldn't be enough, there is also the problem that the host can see the IP addresses of all players that connect to him, and anti-cheat is also always a big concern when you trust the client to handle the entire hit registration and simulation. Then we got the peer-to-peer -peer network model, which you usually see in 1v1 fighting games. But a recent game that is using this model in game modes with more than two players is For Honor. So in this network model, we do not have a dedicated server, nor is a client elected to host the match and run the simulation. However, one player is elected to be the session host, which then takes care of invites and handshakes. In For Honor, every client runs its own synchronized simulation and sends its data to every other client. This means that every client is also partially a game server. The pros of this setup are that the publisher or studio does not have to pay for expensive game servers that must be hosted in many different regions. Players in remote regions can play with their friends at relatively low pings, 
and this model should not suffer from the host advantage issue that client hosted games have. However, there are quite a few videos out there which show that lag switching is still working to some degree. One downside of this network model is that the game will pause for several seconds when the session host leaves as another client must then take over his function. That said, while this is very disruptive, it does not take as long as when the game host disappears in a client hosted match. Another downside is that because every client runs its own simulation, the responsiveness of the hit registration will probably also vary depending on the ping of the player you engage. So when you fight a player to which you have a ping of 5 milliseconds, then the hit registration might feel better than when you engage a player to which you have a ping of 148 milliseconds. Or players who have a high ping make the hit registration less responsive in general as the clients keep the simulation in sync. Probably the biggest downside of this model is security, as every game client knows and sees the WAN IP addresses of the other players. Besides that, there are a few other concerns that this peer-to-peer -peer model has in common with client-hosted matches, like the impact of underpowered hardware used by the players as well as the player's consumer-grade internet connection as all clients talk to each other to keep their simulation in sync. And anti-cheat is also always a big concern in games that do not have an authoritative game server. So, even though dedicated servers do not magically provide 100% lag-free connections, I believe that they offer the best possible experience in online multiplayer games where you have more than two players participate in a match. Now, what does H1C1 use? Considering the player count, I think that it does not come as a surprise that it uses dedicated servers, which are available in North America, South America, Europe, Asia and Australia. So to find out where the European servers are located, I took a look at NetLimiter to find the IP with the highest traffic and then enter that at iplocation.net to find out that this server is hosted in San Diego, which is not in Europe. I then tried to ping the server, but sadly it does not respond to an ICMP echo request. So I then tried the tracer route, where the last hop is in Amsterdam. And in games that host servers in Amsterdam, I usually have a ping of 25 milliseconds. So what does this tell us? Well, the information shown here inside of iplocation.net could simply be outdated. This would be the first time that I've seen this when looking up the location of a game server, but it's surely possible that this information is just false. So if the game server is indeed located in Amsterdam, to which I usually have a ping of 25 milliseconds, then this means that the ping that we see in the top right corner is most likely the latency of the game data and not the result of an ICMP echo request which is nothing unusual as many games show the latency of the game data as ping. Now, what update rates does this game use? When we take a look at the network data captured with Wireshark, then it's clear that this game does not use a fixed rate at which data is sent and received. However, when I take the average of 50 updates, then the client sends about 45 updates per second to the game server and receives about 40 updates per second from the server. And that sounds quite good. However, what does this all mean for the delay that two players experience when they play on the same server? To test this, I use a high-speed camera, two PCs where each of them has its own fiber internet connection, and 144Hz gaming monitors on which the game runs at more than 144fps, with all graphic options set to the lowest value. To measure the delays between the players, I point my high-speed camera at the monitors, and then have player 2 shoot 20 times at player 1. Inside the high-speed recording, I then look for the frame where I see that player 2 started to fire, and then I count the frames until I see that the damage was received by player 1, which is indicated by either blood splatter, a damage indicator, or the update of the health indicator depending on what happens first and what is available in the game. In addition to this damage delay test, I also check the delay of the gunfire animation, as well as the movement delay. So with an in-game ping of 31 milliseconds, which might be an ICMP ping of 25 milliseconds considering that the server appears to be hosted in Amsterdam, I measured an average damage delay of 93 milliseconds, an average gunfire delay of 200 milliseconds and an average movement delay of 202 milliseconds. Which is very high considering the low ping and the quite high update rates of 45 and 40 Hz. However, we do not know what information is exchanged in these updates, so these high rates could mean nothing. Now, if you have watched my previous netcode analysis videos, then you know that this is the first time that I include results from a damage delay test. So in order to give you something to compare these values to, I had to revisit a few older games to test the damage delay there. 
but since these tests are very time consuming, I could sadly not revisit all of them to get data for this video. Now, what do these long delays mean for the gameplay? When two players, which both have an in-game ping of around 30 milliseconds, engage each other, then it's no surprise that the receiving player will take damage far behind cover. And when the shooter has a very high ping, then the server will still register the hit and the receiving player will get that damage even further behind cover, which results in a very bad experience for that player who has a ping of just 30 milliseconds. So we know that when a player has a high ping, then his data needs a long time to travel between the client and the game server. This means that a player who has a low ping might already see himself behind cover, while the player with the high ping can still see him. The reason why the high ping player can still hit him is that the game uses lag compensation. If you now think that we just have to remove lag compensation and then everything is fine, then you are wrong, because that would make a game unplayable even at low pings of just 50 milliseconds. What we really need is that more games finally use sane limits for how much lag they compensate. Now, I do not want to suggest that the values used in Battlefield 4 are the best, but in this game the lag compensation causes that the player will get his hit confirmed by the server as long as he has a ping of less than 250 milliseconds. Once his ping is higher than that, the server will simply reject his hit in this situation, which means that the high ping player sees the impact animation and the blood splatter, but he will not get a hit marker as his shot will not deal any damage. This is what many players refer to as dusting. So why does the server reject the hit in this situation once the shooter has a ping of more than 250 milliseconds? As we all know, the time that data needs to travel between the player and the server causes that the perspective of the server differs from the perspective of the player. How much it differs depends on how long the data needs to travel between them or how high the player's ping is. So when the shooter has a ping of 250 milliseconds, then he sees our low ping player here, while the server sees him here and the low ping player sees himself here. The server will stop to register a hit once the difference between where the server sees the target player and where the shooter sees him gets too big, which happens when the ping of the shooter increases to more than 250 milliseconds in this example, or when the target moves faster, which is why Battlefield games use two different lag compensation or frame history time values, one for infantry combat and one for vehicle combat. If you would use the infantry combat lag compensation or frame history time value for vehicle combat 2, then you would get constant dusting in dogfights because jets are a lot faster than infantry players. A few of you might remember that there even was a bug in Battlefield 4 which caused that exact issue. So even at very low pings, H1C1 King of the Kill does suffer from very long delays and uses quite strong lag compensation. However, while a delay of 200 milliseconds is definitely way too much, the question is if there is a limit to how short the delay can be considering that we have 200 players on the server. But maybe the results that I have provided here can help to encourage the developers to try and reduce the delay that players are affected by. So I hope that you enjoyed this netcode analysis of H1C1 King of the Kill and if you like this kind of niche content where I take a look at the inner workings of video games and show you how these affect your experience, then you can help me to cover the costs of this channel by supporting me through Patreon, the link is in the description below. Also if you want to know what I'm currently working on, then you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook, the links are also in the description of this video. If you enjoyed this video then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.